Good afternoon. So this morning, uh, we heard from our four earlier panelists um, very deep personal sharing of their experiences um, in sanghas, working to transform uh, Buddhist identity within sanghas for both people of color and for um, white people as well. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to zoom out and take the conversation about race and Buddhism outside of the Sangha itself and look at larger social structures. Uh, Buddhism is often regarded as a system that works to transform individuals rather than one which transforms social structures. Engaged Buddhism, a term coined by Vietnamese Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh, is a movement that has responded to this tendency by suggesting the importance of tackling social and political issues as a fundamental component of the Buddhist path. We've already heard a bit of engaged Buddhist perspectives by looking at the social structure of sanghas. Um, and now we're going to take that engaged Buddhist view and kind of expand it out and explore the theoretical basis for Buddhist responses to structural racism, inquiring into the forms of activism that correspond or are in tension with Buddhist frameworks, and wondering together what Buddhism might be able to offer mainstream discourses um, on the topic of race and racism. So our panelists for this afternoon uh, furthest to my right is Professor Charles Hallisey, who received an MDiv from Harvard Divinity School and a PhD from the University of Chicago. He is the Yehan Numata Senior Lecturer on Buddhist Literatures at Harvard Divinity School. His research centers on Theravada Buddhism in Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia, Pali language and literature, Buddhist ethics and literature in Buddhist culture. He is currently working on a book project entitled Flowers on the Tree of Poetry, the Moral Economy of Literature in Buddhist Sri Lanka. And then directly to my right is Anushka Fernanda Pule. Um, she's a Dharma teacher who has trained for over 25 years in the Theravada Buddhist tradition in the United States, India, and Sri Lanka. She teaches retreats and workshops around the world. Anushka also works as a leadership coach and management consultant, influenced by a BA in anthropology and religion from Harvard and an MBA from the Yale School of Management. Anushka is on the Teachers Council at Spirit Rock Meditation Center in California and leads a weekly group in San Francisco Monday night, called Monday Night Dharma. Her teaching is informed by nature, creative arts, political engagement, social justice, and modern urban life. Uh, Roshi sings alone to my left, who many of you met before, is ordained in the Zen Garland Order. He's the spiritual director of the Red Path Zen within that order. Red Path Zen incorporates certain Native American concepts and ceremonies into a Zen practice. Roshi sings alone is, enrol is an enrolled member of the Georgia tribe of Eastern Cherokee and has extensive experience in Lakota ceremony, including Sweat Lodge and Chinupa Wakan sacred pipe practices. He is the author of the book Stalking Nirvana the Native American Red Path Zen Way. And all the way on my left is Donna Bivens, who currently works as a project director of the Boston Busing Desegregation Project at the Union of Minority Neighborhoods. Before working at UMN, she served many years as co-director of the Women's Theological uh, Center in Boston, a center of women's theological education grounded in social action. Donna has worked with scores of organizations around the country to help facilitate their creation of diverse, inclusive, equitable, culturally competent, and high-performing organizations. Her racial equity work focuses on systemic racism, class, and internalized racism. So to start, um, beginning with Professor Halsey and moving this way, uh, just have each speaker uh, say a few words about their interest in this discussion. Um, and then we'll move into some more formal questions. Well, first, I would just want to thank 
Christopher and Darren for inviting me to this. Um, my own interest in it, uh, I would say, simply come from being an American, uh, having to kind of grapple with things of what it means to be an American in a country that is defined in its history by a history of things of an encounter with Africa, and then uh, things about race. Uh, what I want to concentrate on, though, is not really speaking about me, but some th thoughts I had in leading up to thinking about this afternoon. And my own thoughts, found my, I found myself going in a direction not asking, what does uh, Buddhism bring to discussions about race? But rather, what can Buddhism become because of an encounter with race in the United States? We might, in some sense, uh, put this in a way that, more clearly of uh, what the Buddhasasana can become uh, it, it, because of an encounter with race in the United States, because uh, and also what we can learn about the Buddha Dharma that we haven't seen before, because, but that the encounter with race will help us to see. In some sense, what I'm saying is something similar to what the scholar of uh, East Asian Buddhism, Bernard Four, said about the Buddhism's encounter in China, that there was a double exposure, and that Buddhism became something by this encounter in China, in which he went so far as to say, there is no Buddhism without China. And so we might look to a future in which people would look back and say, there is no Buddhism without what happened in the United States. What I've handed out to you is something from the website of the radio show uh, On Being, a very interesting thing that put together by one of the editors on the radio show, uh, Trent Gillis, is called The Tree of Contemplative Practices. Let me just begin at the, at the two roots where, of the tree. What I reckon, or what I think I see in those two roots is a reflection of the, uh, the statement attributed to the Buddha in which he would, uh, asked, what does the religious life stand on? And he said it stands on two legs. One is focused attention, or awareness here. In Pali, it's manisikaro. Uh, the other that's described here as communion and connection. In the Pali, it's referred to as the voice of another, paratogoso. And so it's those two legs that are the, the, the whole religious life stands on. And in some sense, the encounter with race in the United States is learning how to listen to the voice of another. And in some sense, what has already happened for many uh, uh, Christian communities uh, and other kinds of communities in which uh, particularly women of African descent have been part of them, uh, the, what we might refer to as, what we know as the womanist movement, of learning to listen to different voices of others as ways of in imagining a different kind of future. So it's this basic issue of looking at the two uh, roots here, and then to just say, oh, all of these different contemplative practices, it's very interesting to say that activism, work, and volunteering are also contemplative practices. How to imagine uh, those things as activism, work, and volunteering, and so on, as being contemplative practice. But to say that everything, all meditation practice, all contemplative practice of every sort, in some sense, needs to be informed by this voice of another that has to do with race. What we could look forward to is to say that learning how to deal with, that, with the issue, the, the, the reality of race in the United States will help us to deal with the realities of class and gender too, which we haven't done very well either about. And so this is one of the things that all of these are interconnected. And that it, it's not what Buddhism brings to our understanding of these, but how our encounter with these realities will change the Buddhist asana and lead to a better understanding of uh, the Buddha Dharma. In this, what I'm saying then is that what we uh, think we should focus on are practices, not principles, uh, and how the practices themselves reveal certain things, and so that the issue is not what are first principles, but are practices that relate us to other people. The other thing, then, just to finish, is the issue for me is also something about institutions, and what are the institutions that will be adequate to uh, a future that we may want to aspire to. Not only institutions of sanghas, but also ad hoc uh, institutions that are meant to address the, rea the social realities of the world around us. Uh, we might look forward to having something in Buddhist communities that is like the Southern Christian Leadership Council that uh, is appropriate to re remind ourselves about this weekend since it's the 50th anniversary of the marches from Selma to Montgomery. 
uh, which led to the, the voting rights movement and then also to the Voting Rights Act. And then what we can say is also that, or to ask about how Buddhist communities can work with other communities to create other kinds of institutions that are meant to address certain kinds of issues and not only looking internally to what are the problems of Buddhist sanghas themselves. Thank you. Boy, you're interested in this, right? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so, um, good afternoon. Um, I'm happy to be here. As was mentioned, I was actually an undergrad at Harvard College, and I was just looking at my um, yearbook before I came here. I live in San Francisco, and uh, I noticed that I'd put in my, you know, you list your clubs and things like that, so I put the sports that I played and um, various uh, you know, magazines that I was on and various things, and then I'd listed the Harvard Radcliffe Sangha, um, which actually didn't exist at the time. Um, so I kind of made it up, and it was a, um, uh, it was like a, a statement of my own uh, commitment and interest. I was actually just practicing on my own, in my room. Um, and I didn't even know if it would clear the yearbook because it was not an actual club, but it makes me so happy to see this community here now and this conference because of that. So, um, so yeah, my own life has moved from, uh, you know, having studied um, Buddhism here, uh, academically as an undergrad, and then um, going into being a practitioner. And I actually, directly after graduating from Harvard, um, spent four years in full-time practice, basically, um, Dharma practice at um, Insight Meditation Society, and then I went to Sri Lanka and lived in some monasteries and traveled around India. So that was sort of my first graduate degree, unofficially. Um, and then came back to the US, lived in Boston, and actually was working um, in uh, at uh, various nonprofits, and uh, I worked at Fenway Community Health Center, LGBT Health Center, um, and was kind of an activist during this period of time. Um, and then went on to get an MBA, which is kind of about you know, systems thinking um, about the world. And somewhere along the line there, uh, my teacher told me to start teaching uh, Dharma, too, actually while I was getting my MBA. So uh, it's been a kind of a wacky journey like that. Um, but so this topic is very close to my heart as someone who's an activist, as someone who, uh, I feel like my life is bridging many different worlds, and I'm interested in how, uh, as the Dharma moves into the West, uh, what this looks like, you know, what, what our contributions are, as uh, Professor Halsey was saying, how this changes. Um, so among the things that, are, that interest me are, are uh, how technology impacts our lives, our practice, um, how social justice uh, and how the Dharma can encounter the issues and challenges of our society. Uh, which includes racism, classism, um, patriarchy, all of this, and uh, work with that. Uh, and how we can speak to this as modern 21st century people, like how any kind of practice, uh, faith, uh, institutions can morph and can become relevant for us today, you know, both p personally and societally. So I feel like in some way my life uh, is an experiment of this sort. Um, I come more as a, a practitioner, a teacher, uh, activist than as an academic, uh, I would say. Um, so I hope my contributions here can be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. A long time ago. <laughs> a long time ago. A very long time ago. And so now you know, it was a long time ago. All the peoples, the four-leggeds, <clears throat> discovered that the earth was drifting away from the heavens. What are we going to do? The earth is drifting away. Everything will be destroyed this way. So a big council was called. All the four-leggeds got together. Bear, who was always in charge, said, oh, now we got this problem. The earth and the sky are drifting apart. But don't you all worry, I'll take care of it. The bear was used to taking care of things. So he got out to the edge of the earth, and he summoned all of his strength, and he pushed and pushed and pushed, pushed, but nothing happened. Coyote said, I'll take care of it. He was quite the magician. And he went off in the desert, and he built a sacred fire, and he burned smudge. He did all those things, and he danced, and he chanted, but Earth continued to slip away from the sky. Grandmother Spider says, well, maybe I can do something. But no one else taught much for her, you know, but what could it hurt? So Grandmother Spider made her way to the edge of the Earth, 
And she reached way down inside herself and she pulled and pulled and pulled until she had a long strand of web. And she swung it and swung it and flung it out over the boy. And it missed. Too short. So she went back. Once again, she pulled and pulled and pulled and she swung it and flung it. And once again, it was too short. Once again, she pulled and pulled and pulled and pulled and pulled and, pulled and swung it and swung it and flung it out over the void and it connected to the sky. Then she made her way all the way across that strand, that strand of web until she was at the edge of the sky. And she rested. It had been hard work. And then she began to spin once again, and she swung a whole strand back to connect it to the earth. And then once again to the sky, and to the earth, and to the sky, and to the earth, until she had laced the sky and earth together so they would never be separated. But she didn't stop. She went. She connected the human beings to each other and to the sky to the trees and the rivers. And so she had tied her webs together until all creation was connected. And so they say, that's why you must never hurt Grandmother Spider, because she has made us one with everything. Now in Red Path Zen, in Zen, it's radical oneness. Individuals within the oneness you know, everything is exactly formed and everything is exactly empty, but we're all one in our own individual ways. And for me, what, what Buddhism has to offer is a radical sense of oneness which incorporates everything, not just other human beings, but everything into one living organic whole. So out of that kind of awareness, we cannot stand to see any of our brothers and sisters uh, experiencing racial or economic injustice. We can't stand to see people living in hunger. We can't stand to see people living without respect. So Buddhism has a lot to offer, a lot to offer out there in terms of teaching, oneness, and experiencing it, and doing something about it, not just theoretically holding it. That's the problem, I think. We have wonderful theoretical feelings of oneness. Isn't oneness nice? But we've got to do something to experience that oneness in ourselves and make it real to the world. So that's where I come from. Isn't that profound? I love it. <laughs> I love it. I said I love stories. Um, uh, so, hello everybody. Um, I just want to start. I think you said this, Darren, but I, I'm replacing Cheryl Giles, who wasn't able to be here uh, th this afternoon. So I'm a little nervous because I haven't a lot, had a lot of time to, to pull, pull my thoughts together and I've heard so much that's been, just has so much percol percolating inside me, so bear with me. But um, uh, what, I, what I should first say is that I am not a, a Buddhist. Um, I have, I feel like um, a lot of who I am, though, has been informed by Buddhism. I like to call it a very generous tradition because this whole, this whole uh, centuries of people struggling with how to go inside, how to, how, to, how to go inside. So when I've been lost, like when I've had my, tr my issues with my own tradition, Buddhism has been something that has been there and that I could embrace that, the, the, the breadth of experience of that tradition without having to, in quotes, become a Buddhist. But I have to say that oh, there's so many things about the tradition that are just so rich for me. And um, the, other, the other thing um, that, that I just want, want that there's one other thing I want to say about that, which is that, um, um, hold on just a sec, I'm sorry. I'm glad I'm in here with people who respect the silence because there might be some in here. <laughs> Um, oh, I know. It's that, for me, racism is fundamentally a spiritual disease. And so it's only when we get to that level, whether we're talking individually or collectively, that we really get to the roots of 
racism and, and, and uprooting it. So um, that's, you know, that's what brings me here. That's what makes me want to be a part of this conversation because I found that people who spend that time, and communities who spend that time knowing themselves and, and being in touch with themselves and, 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 the, and, that, and the, the one making, coming to oneness within ourselves and coming to oneness within our community are able to go places. A lot of times, I have to say, when I look at the politics and the spirituality, the political people aren't sometimes able to go there as easily. So um, I just find that this is the place where we can grapple with the deeper dimensions of what, what we're doing on this planet to each other, with each other, and to the rest of our creation. Yeah, thank you. Son, uh, thank you, panelists. Um, in typical fashion, um, Professor Hallisey has taken all of my questions and turned them around, so now I have to rethink how I want to ask the questions to the panel. Um, so I'm not going to talk about Buddhism making a contribution, but we'll talk about uh, the encounter. You can. <laughs> Um, but I think that uh, Donna is also reflecting this, uh, particularly with, without becoming a Buddhist, but, um, you, but leveraging the tools of Buddhism for transformation with particular regard to racism. Um, and so my, my first question is, what, what might this encounter with, uh, between Buddhism and racism look like? Um, how do we think about the theory and practices uh, in Buddhism and the actual effects of racism that we're seeing in the world? How, how might we begin to imagine this encounter becoming uh, deeper and deeper? And this can be, uh, anybody can take this question on, there's no particular order. I have some thoughts, I'll start. Yeah. Um, and the, the, uh, my family's originally from Sri Lanka. Uh, I was born and raised in the US, and um, the kind of um, practice that I do is also the, uh, from the Theravada Buddhist tradition, so insight, meditation, vipassana practice, so the old school Buddhism. Those who don't know. So, uh, so actually, you know, historically, um, the Buddha was very radical in uh, 6th century BC, uh, in particularly in the monastic order, uh, in uh, outlawing caste, basically. You know, caste was a very, very strong system, and uh, northern India still uh, continues to be uh, existing. And so this is not like in 1965 or something like this, but this is like, you know, 500-something BC. Uh, he said, you know, when you enter the order, uh, your caste is gone, and so it doesn't matter. And, and some of the monastics would be like, I don't want to sit with that guy because he's the wrong guy. And it would be like, tough, that's it. You know, like, everyone is uh, worthy. And there are many dialogues where uh, it's talking to, particularly to Brahmins, and basically uh, breaking down their notions of who's more worthy. Um, and uh, basically got at, like, character, you know, at character and asked, asked them questions about, like, who is possible of, who, whose heart is possible of spreading love? Like, whose possible, heart is possible of a realization, and uh, it really broke down a lot of the, the structures of that time. So I think that's interesting to, to note, that it's a very radical tradition in that way uh, from the very start. I feel like also the, the emphasis in, in Dharma of understanding causality is very helpful, and that's something that um, in analysis of um, racism in this culture, in this time, there's, there's often a desire to kind of skip over or uh, to look for particular signs that look like things are better, like the election of a president uh, who, one time uh, who might be a person of color, uh, and to want to skip over and ignore uh, elements of what's happening in the world. So uh, there's some understanding about the causality, like you know, the, the trauma of generations of uh, slavery and uh, injustice that it's helpful to look at. And in some ways, like when you see things happening over and over again, such as um, 
violence against young men of color. You know, it's not an accident that this happens. Like you can see the, the causality is there. And so then it uh, points to looking at that, understanding the roots of that, um, and addressing that from the roots somewhere. Uh, and then the third one, of course, is the more common one that I feel like people in the US tend to be drawn to Buddhism because of the meditation practice, you know, because of the tools for understanding the mind and heart. And that's very powerful, certainly. And um, within that, I'd say particularly uh, looking at the factors of perception, uh, the analysis of perception, sanya, um, those of you who are uh, practitioners here, uh, is critical and is really pointed out in a very skillful way by the Buddha. And um, because my interest also is in, like technology, I think it's interesting, like uh, recently some of you may have seen this meme that's going around about a dress that looks one way, all right? In one picture this way, it looks like uh, blue and black, and then it looks like uh, gold and white, and like which one it is in. Um, I feel like there are different ways in which we're starting to question perception, um, and it's helpful, you know, question the validity of what arises in the mind as perception, whether that's absolutely true, you know. Um, and that's helpful at starting to, I think, untangle some of the, the roots of uh, racism. Uh, or understanding uh, our preconceived ideas. And um, in, in the Bay Area where I live, also there's been more recently a, a recognition, um, particularly in a very, very successful uh, tech industry. Uh, actually, when you look at the demographics of, of that, of like who actually is uh, in the top ranks there and who's making a lot of money in uh, tech industry, it's like ridiculous. You know, it's ridiculously skewed towards white and male, a uh, little bit of Asian, you know, it's like, Definitely. So, and it's, it's very interesting because now these companies are starting to look at like, oh, uh, is it possible that there's unconscious bias at play here? You know? <laughs> and so then, I mean, really, seriously, there's like, it's like a new thing to look at that, that like, wow, you know, like we don't mean to do this, but look how it turns out. Like, the, you know, these like statistics, particularly a lot of tech people, like statistics are facts for them. So it's like, wow, look at this. How did this come up? So now there's starting to be some analysis of like, oh, wow, is it possible there's some unconscious way in which we might uh, play this out, and like, how, how does that uh, how does that act? So I think you know, being able to look at the mind and how it works, and the conditioning of the mind um, is very helpful. And I think the Dharma uh, Buddhist practices bring a lot of tools that uh, are not there in other places for understanding that. Let me speak a little bit about this. <clears throat> Wherever there is injustice. inequality, uh, hunger. I think Buddhists, because of our sense of, of relatedness, oneness, do get involved, need to get involved. I'll tell you, uh, I love stories. Uh, one of the things that has always meant a lot to me, in fact, during the civil rights period, uh, things were happening in the native world as well. It wasn't as widely known. But you probably do remember that, uh, unfortunately, during the same time Richard Nixon was in such difficulty, uh, there was the uh, Wounded Knee episode going on, where Indian people were trying their best to take a stand for uh, the mistreatment, against the mistreatment that was happening all over the Indian world. It was very shortly after that, the first walk took place of natives walking from the west coast to Washington, D.C., in protest. And that walk was led by a group of Buddhist monks. Yeah, in sandals and with their drums and their saffron robes, walking all the way across this country and standing in solidarity with the native people. I think about that today and it still brings tears to my eyes. Here was a very powerful statement that was being made. Most people don't know about that. I tell you what, in the native world they know about it. And there is a sense of real uh, kinship somehow between particularly the southwestern Indian people and the Tibetan Buddhist people. There's very many ceremonies that are, are quite the same. But bringing that to the present time, uh, we, are, we are aware, or should be aware, of what's happening in this world to, to people of color, people of poverty, uh, there's so many different things that are happening, and it's a place where Buddhists, because we are one, we recognize that in a radical sense, can take stands, both as sanghas and as individuals. 
Now, we, you know, I have, my songs are very small. And in terms of organizing for big events, we, we can, really can't do that. But our individual members are parts of organization and groups that do take stands. And that's where I encourage my people to say, you know, look around you. What needs to be done? Take hold. Take hold and do it out of a sense of what we teach of oneness and belonging. And I think that's a big place for Buddhism to do it. And do it from the center. That's another thing. There's one thing to protest and go out and beat your chest and raise hell uh, and anger and what you create is a lot of static. But it's another place to do it out of your center, which is a place of loving but fierce. I, I love the statement I read in here. I'd never heard this before. Fierce compassion. Fierce compassion. That, to me, is important. Um, for me, for me, um, I I think um, well, I, I have to say I've learned from so many traditions. And one teacher that I had was a man named Maladoma Somme, who used to say that um, sometimes it takes a, a real simplicity to hold a great complexity. And I feel that there's so many things in that that again, as someone who isn't a scholar, who isn't a long-time pr practitioner, but that I can t um, connect with from Buddhism that, that are, there's so much wisdom in something that's put so simply. And so when I made the connection, and I'm, I'm sure this wasn't original, but um, between Dr. King's three e evils, which were um, economic and exploitation and poverty, um, racism, and um, militarism and violence, and realized that there were correlations with Buddhism in the three poisons, that the, the poverty and exploitation were about greed, the racism was a delusion, and the militarism and violence were about hatred. And so, uh, you know, as I've been working with, with that, um, realizing that racism is one of the most recent constructions of how people how people divide themselves it's not it's not old like like religion it's it's pretty new that we've seen people in these boxes that 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 are so tight you know that we can't that you don't let people out of the black and white of it you know um, so re realizing that it, it, it really helped me to, and, and you know, I think there's so many things happening, as someone said this morning in this age of Ferguson, that are putting things together. So that racism isn't just about racism. Racism is about how those three poisons come together. So that um, it, was, it was first about exploitation, and it impoverished people. It was about the, the people living on this land and taking their land from them. It was about bringing people here in order to, out of greed. It was, you know, to me it was nothing but greed. And, um, and something that kept some people out of touch with their humanity. And then, um, in order to keep that moving, you needed, you needed power of violence. It was, a militar it was militarism. Um, and it was violence. And then to hold it in place, to not look at the contradictions in what you said you believed and what you, what you were actually doing, you needed a delusion, a grand delusion. Mm -hmm. And that was that people are not equal, that some people are not equal because they're, in quotes, pagans. Some people are not e equal because they are um, less human because of, I don't know what, but they're black and we're white, so you know that, that whole um, polarization. And so I think there's something in working those in why we keep letting those things get in the way of our um, enlightenment. Uh, of our, conscious, our consciousness, and I, I, I so agree with you know, what you were saying, Anishka, about um, the, um, the importance of the awareness that, that Buddhism calls us to, because, and again, another thing, I just wanted to, there's an idea that 
we've been playing with my friend Cordelia and I and the people at Boston Busing Desegregation Project of uh, uh, a woman a, a um, woman named uh, Dr. King. I can't. I find Joyce King, and she talks about not just unconsciousness or lack of consciousness, but disconsciousness, as in dysfunctional. That the thing around racism is this, that there's a disconsciousness. And um, that she defines disconsciousness as an uncritical habit of mind, including perceptions, attitudes, assumptions, and beliefs that justifies inequity and exploitation by accepting the existing order of things as given. And so, um, again, I think that is probably the, one, of the, one of the greatest gifts is expanding awareness, like really both individually and collectively expanding awareness of how our disconsciousness is holding the system in place. Just like, uh, I am an academic, and uh, it's like sometimes unusual to listen to people, or, or when people say I'm not an academic, that there's something that I feel bad about being an academic. Uh, <laughs> but I am an academic. Uh, and I just want to share one thing that I'm aware of that I think is in some sense important uh, for us, that the history of how we think about race and how we think about caste are, it, they are identical. Uh, the word uh, caste is a Portuguese word. That it's not a South Asian word. And it was introduced in, as part of colonialism, of uh, people trying to make sense of what they saw in South Asia. The Portuguese also gifted to the world some of the major contours of how we think about race. And one of the things that, that they, they spread around Asia, all Buddhist co communities that they came in contact with, that when you look at languages like Singhala or Tamil or Malayalam in South India, the word kaf derivatives of kafir, as in the word, as in the Kafir war, war in South Africa, means African. So the Buddhist communities that we're in touch with have already had encounters with Africa, in which that's part of their communities. In the ways that us encountering things from, about Buddhism in South Asia have already encountered it through categories like caste. So that it's not that there's something that we we're meeting something that oh, this is not already been connected. So there's a kind of truth to of saying that we're all post-colonial. Uh, all of us have been changed by what happened during the colonial period. And that the colonial period can't be understood without looking at forced labor, slaver, slavery and other forms of it around the world. Uh, but that's part of what the, the legacy of being post-colonial is. So I want to pick up on, uh, we'll do questions at the end. Um, I want to pick up on uh, what Roshi Sings Along mentioned as uh, fierce compassion. Um, and I'm interested in what models of fierce compassion might look like um, and how, what the interaction with social justice and compassion is. There's a different narrative around uh, social justice and a different narrative, uh, perhaps a different narrative around compassion, but perhaps not. Perhaps there's an intersection or perhaps compassion sheds light on, injust uh, on social justice in a particular kind of way. Um, and I'm also thinking about, I think it was Donna who mentioned um, this, yeah, that this space is being uh, not just a political space, but being a, a sacred, this is being a sacred um, practice for us, but it's also political. And so what, what the intersection of the sacred and the political looks like, um, and particularly with regard to compassion and justice. Well, I I may be wrong about this, but it seems to me that Buddhism comes out of the tradition of the East where there wasn't a whole lot of uh, ability to have social, political justice in the, uh, in the sense that we think of it. Uh, and so 
for Buddhism, there hasn't been that uh, drive for uh, political and social justice, legal kinds of stuff that uh, you might find in the Christian uh, communities uh, or other communities here. Compassion has been our way. But I think when uh, you know you take care of you take care of needs as you see them, you try to meet them uh, socially engaged in every way you can. But I, I just have I've been playing with this whole idea of fierce compassion, and I see you know I see us uh, on the streets taking positions, but coming from our again coming from a center place, uh, recognizing our oneness. Boy, you you're going to get tired of hearing me say this, but our oneness with the people that or on the other side of the issue. I, I forget which Buddhist teacher was said that I always remember on there, uh, there are two correct sides to every argument, mm -hmm. you know, but, and, and we can be fierce in our, our compassion and in what we believe to be true and has to be changed and all that, uh, but also come from a center which recognizes that uh, the other side is coming from a place of ignorance, but uh, they're not necessarily uh, evil. We are are one. They may have evil ideas, but uh, I try. I try not to get caught up in the good, bad stuff. I spent most of my life caught up in good people, bad people, uh, and I don't want to go there anymore. But I certainly don't want to back off. I'm a political nut. You know, I'm involved in every political campaign and all that kind of stuff. But I want to come at it from a period, from a, from a place of, of my center, a place of my meditation, and uh, of recognizing that ultimately what I want is I want justice. I want the right kinds of life for people, but I want to myself not lose my center as I do it. I I so agree with that, and I although I I have to say I think they're using more than two sides to the argument, but um, I um, I I I just have this little story of coming out of the movie The Wolf of Wall Street. Did anybody see that movie? Mm -hmm. I watched that movie, and then I, 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 my friend and I, uh, Lisa and I, went to see it, and we came out, we couldn't stop talking about it, because the thing was, it was like, this is the same energy that was in 12 Years a Slave. And it was like, so many of the things were the same, in terms of the addiction, the misogyny, the, the greed, the violence. And it was like, wow, it's the same story. And then, you know, then we said, oh, and even uh, DiCaprio played in Django. <laughs> so it was like the same story. And so um, the question for me was, um, the two questions that I started asking was, how is this energy in me? And how is this energy in my community? And what can I do about it? How can I protect myself and us against it? What's the, what's the work around it? And so um, I think that um, the, the compassion starts with self and really knowing that it's all in us. It's all in us. And so um, what is, what, and, and if it's all in us, what does that mean? What, is, what, what does it mean? And we have to figure it out together. I don't think, and, I, and we can only figure out together, to me, if we stay grounded, really grounded in our own experience, uh, always increasing our awareness of what our experience is, because I realize that so often I deny my own reality. I, I just do. I just deny my own reality. And I, 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 you know, and I think with Ferguson, it's really, the age of Ferguson has come, become much clearer for me how much I deny my reality because, you know, I, I, I've been thinking about the expression, the race card. It's like, you know, okay, so what are all the other cards? You know, I get one. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah. Play yours. And so, yeah, play mine. I get, my, I get one card. And it's like, my whole life is another game, and you know, it's in, and hopefully it's a more, more a more a infinite game than a you know winners and losers game. But um, you know, I I think the compassion is both honoring our own experience and journey, and going through the hard work, like you're saying, of honoring other people's experience and journey because. 
you know, it's it's a long, it's a it's a long haul. It's a, it's it's like a spiritual journey. You never finish it. It's just not going <coughs> to get finished unless we're enlightened. And you know, <laughs> I don't know about that happening anytime soon. <laughs> In some ways, you could say that the uh, teachings of the Dharma is saying that the universe is basically a lawful universe. So, uh, arguably, there is justice baked in, and ethics. Actually, it's an ethical universe also. So, this is some of the teaching around causality, right? Now, this is in the long haul, big picture, of course. So, you don't see that necessarily in the short term. So, then, what is our calling also as practitioners um, and as those committed to the path then? Uh, I was just somebody that has to do also with the commitment to the um, ethical precepts, the training precepts, and so then uh, enacting those both in our individual actions, but then also collectively, uh, systemically. So, for example, in the training precepts, you know, the first ones around um, undertake the training to avoid destroying life, right? So killing living beings. Uh, so that's kind of the bright line one, but then below that, not harming, and then even below that, more broadly, is uh, protection of life, uh, creating conditions for safety. So what does that look like for us? Um, how do we enact that? So that can be both sense of compassion and uh, justice, I feel, as that's played out. Uh, or around uh, undertake the training to refrain from taking what's not freely offered. So paying attention to acquisitiveness or greed is one thing, but then also cultivating uh, generosity, renunciation. So on a bigger scale, also looking at um, the division of wealth, for example, in our society, which has gotten uh, so pronounced uh, <coughs> So uh, you know, this is something, I listened to part of the, the last panel also about um, you know, sanghas, and one thing that I notice in some of the um, primarily white sanghas is there's a, when there's an urge to do some service project, it often is like, let's go to this country far away. Um, uh, oftentimes like some Buddhist, like Sri Lanka or Thailand or Burma or um, Africa or something and help people there. And um, meanwhile, there's like stepping over, like actually suffering people in that very place. And I think it's, you know, it's difficult for people to uh, open to the suffering that's around. And also that's largely uh, reflected in race too. Right? Um, so for myself, for example, I'm on a, a commission in the city of San Francisco that um, works on community development and housing. Uh, to me, that's an expression of both compassion and justice. You know, in San Francisco now, the, the Gini coefficient, which you know, measures inequality, uh, we're at the same level as Rwanda. I mean, it's like the inequality, and in the US it's not, as a whole, it's not much better than that. Actually, it's the same as Sri Lanka. I think Sri Lanka might be slightly better now you know, than the US. So uh, there's work to be done here, and I think that can be an expression of our training and uh, commitment to both justice and compassion. So I think I have one more question for the panel, and then I'll uh, turn it over to um, the rest of you for any questions you may have. Um, I think this is more of a personal question than anything else, um, but maybe it reflects some other people's uh, in this room's experience. Um, one thing that I'm, I haven't figured out for myself when I am thinking about uh, activism in particular is I'm cautious of what I see as polarizing forms of activism, aggression, etc. But I'm also uncomfortable with my discomfort. So I'm, I'm concerned that um, part of my discomfort is only wanting to be in like a calm Buddhist environment when I'm addressing things, not wanting to um, be more into the fray. And so, um, and uh, as Anushka is saying that we can, that fierce compassion and justice can be reflections of our practice, I'm very much trying to figure out what that might look like as I, as I go forward. Um, and so uh, I'm looking for help. I suggest that you look at uh, Unitarian Universalism as an institutional way of being very socially active, um, I think it's not, a, it's not an unusual thing that so many Zen sanghas are housed in Universalist Unitarian churches uh, because they, that really is a basic thrust of, uh, of that group of 
respecting the right and dignity of all human beings, but being fiercely uh, proactive in terms of uh, taking stands. Uh, and I think it's great for Zen, small Zen songs to have a, a group like that they can identify with and uh, do some of these things. I, I would say, I, would say, I struggle with that a lot because I, you know, for over 20 years, I was at the Women's Theological Center, which I now see as a little cocoon in terms of doing social justice work because it was really, you know, very eth highly ethical, um, highly committed, really ready to grapple with the hard questions group of women, you know, some of which, whom were here at Harvard Divinity School. Um, and um, I, in fact, Cheryl, that's where I first met Cheryl Giles, was working at the Women's Theological Center. So, you know, we were doing our work and it was just so different than being in an in a, 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 um, African-American-led organizing organization in Boston. And um, uh, I, I, what I, what, it was different because then you really have to have to face the the power differentials around um, everything, you know, and that's what what racism is about. You know, you're not everybody's not trying to help you necessarily, and a lot of times the people that really could care less about the justice issues that you're concerned with, you don't even see because they're so far apart. They're so wealthy. They don't have to see the suffering. They don't have to know the suffering. Um, they don't have to listen. And so we had a, you know, a listening project that the, the resistance has gotten at high levels has been shocking to me. It's like, why does somebody res resist this little organization? You know, as a, you know that's what, what I was thinking. But um, there, you know, and, 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 I, and I think I grapple with it too, and I think that's the place for us to grapple with. Um, you know, for those, you know, as, as Sweet Honey sings, we who believe in freedom, you know, it is about liberation, human liberation. Um, and and I, I, don't, I don't know sometimes that we bring our practices enough to looking at how do you really deal with um, people for, you know, again, I don't, it's not a question of not loving them or not seeing them as fully human being. That's never been my, my problem, but how do you grapple with people who really don't care about this, you know, and who have a lot of power? Um, how do we bring our belief system to that? And we have to bring it to that too, not just, I mean, we have to bring it to each other, but we also have to be engaged with people who really could care less about the things that we're talking about today. In um, the path of uh, practice, there are many different qualities of heart and mind that are cultivated. Um, and some of them are definitely about tranquility. Um, and, uh, and I think because a lot of, uh, sort of Western Buddhist attraction has been towards meditation, there's been a focus on um, that as an emphasis. But also there's the qualities of heart and mind like uh, determination um, and energy and effort. And there's, it's really helpful, I think, to cultivate the you know, sort of manjushri, just cutting through, you know, um, both in one's, the way one works with one's own mind, because there's a lot of like, uh, stuff that goes through there too, right? that you don't have to just roll on with. Uh, and uh, you know, sometimes it's just good to develop that, the ability to be like, enough, boom. Right? It doesn't always work, but you don't have to cultivate that. Uh, and to, that can come from a place of clear seeing. You know, if it doesn't come from a place of hatred, it can come from a place of um, balance and wisdom, and uh, it can be very powerful. Uh, so even historically, you know, reading the um, accounts of the stories of the Buddha, he also uh, did not suffer fools, and uh, he called out wrong view. Like you know, they had they had a lot of conflict in that time, and. Uh, he was not like being nicey nice to everyone all the time, really. So uh, it's interesting to read that and to see, you know, that there's been some interpretation now about like how one should be to be Buddhist. But uh, there, there are different ways in which, uh, even as a teacher or as a you know the leader of a order or movement, um, he dealt with people who came to him, and some of them were quite uh, tough and clear and uh, calling things out. So I think that can be um, part of our practices, particularly in calling out. Uh, harm that's being done in the world. Yeah. 
individually and collectively. So. Can I just say something to Darren? Uh, because he put it in the framework of, oh, it's a personal question. So in some sense, for me, it's not a question per se about Buddhism. But it's a personal question. What came to my mind is an anecdote about uh, William Penn and George Fox. William Penn, when he converted to Quakerism, was an admiral in the British Navy. Part of his conversion was to pacifism. But he said to Fox, uh, I'm not comfortable not wearing my sword. And Fox didn't say to him, give it up. He said, wear it as long as you can. And so one of the things that you could say in it is that, oh, there may be things that you're uncomfortable with. And it might be that the best answer for you personally is keep on doing that as long as you can. And then have a confidence that, that part of that is when it's right to call it out, and for you to call it out, you'll know it. But uh, until that point, if you force yourself into it, it's probably likely you're going to get it wrong, and you're going to do it harm. Mm -hmm. And so that's also the issue, too. too. So that, that personal statement, as, do it as long as you can, uh, I think is an important thing for us to take to heart. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, and um, we will have uh, about 20 minutes for uh, Q&A. You can ask uh, the panel in general, or you can have a direct question to a particular panelist. Um, my question has to do with um, it's the question I have for myself. How can we think about applying um, compassion on the institutional level, on the, the level of societal structures? Um, and personally, the way that I think about this is, um, you know, on an interpersonal level, um, I think of equality as actually the enemy of compassion. Um, I worked. I, I volunteered in a um, hospice for um, when, when I was an undergraduate student, and everybody in that building was convinced that they owed the other people more than they were getting, uh, that, that, that they received more than they gave, that they owed everybody else more than um, was owed to them. And um, when I think about words like equality and justice, I don't think that it necessarily has to go down this road of we're all equal and therefore we're not related to each other anymore. But I, I, I wonder how we can generate compassion in institutions in a, in a way that it's not just making everybody equal so that we're no longer indebted to each other. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, the one thing that comes to my own mind uh, that I think speaks to the question about institutions is something that uh, I know that George knows already. It's the inscription of the great uh, Indian emperor Ashoka, where he just refers to the, uh, the fact where he says, uh, someone who loves someone else can't be happy when the person they love is unhappy. And that's why I'm building hospitals. And so one of the things is that he's recognizing that, oh, the hospitals are an institutional way to make it easy for people to learn how to get better so the people that they, who, that they love can also be happy. So we can't live without institutions. Institutions allow us to do things that you know, we can't do as individuals. And so trying to figure out you know, what institutions are about, I think is you know, one of the biggest challenges for us as humans in the 21st century. And I don't think Buddhists are exempt from that. Yeah, I don't think we can make anyone equal. I don't think we can do those kinds of things. I think we can uh, remove obstacles to people becoming what they want to become, the most that they can become. Uh, we can uh, remove the obstacles of uh, inappropriate police action and that type of thing. 
Uh, there, there are things that can be done. It doesn't make anyone anything, but it does provide opportunities and the atmosphere in which uh, people can reach the maximum of whatever they want to become. And I don't think we can dictate that either. In institutions, a couple of places in which there are points of influence is one is paying attention to the organizational culture there. Um, and the culture is often created by the leadership. You know, so um, how does the leadership, uh, how do the leaders act? You know, what are the values that those leaders hold and how is that enacted in conscious and unconscious ways, you know, compassion or otherwise? Um, and you know, if you can think about that even in terms of our country and like how that plays out and um, one area that um, is increasingly um, concerning to me is the rising tide of uh, Islamophobia in our country now. You know, so here we see like new groups of people that are being demonized, um, and uh, new forms of uh, uh, preconceived ideas about people that weren't there maybe 20 years ago in the same way um, playing out. Um, and just noticing, even in some you know small things like uh, actually I actually appreciate that President Obama mentioned in the last um, State of the Union address. Uh, he, you know, listed a bunch of different uh, categories of people. He said something about, uh, you know, peaceful Muslim citizens, and it was like the one line that didn't get any applause in the State of the Union address, mm -hmm. in in his listing of many different people. Even the the gays and lesbians got applause now, and the, you know, <laughs> but like the you know, peaceful Muslim people got no applause from anyone. It was very interesting. Like, oh, the, you know, n nobody in the room is willing to to uh, stand up for that, and that's very painful to to see and. Um, so I think to notice uh, the culture of organizations, the culture of institutions, how that plays out. And that's so many different things, you know, even just physical space layout and um, the way we communicate, what is okay or not okay, how time is conceived of, what are the mythologies that are um, being f put forward, what stories um, are honored, what's the creation story of that organization, you know, like all of that, are, th those are all different avenues in which uh, our values get played out. And I, I would add, it, you know, it's our, it's um, our, our again looking at, 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 in particular racism, but any difference systemically, is that um, you, there, there are reasons that individuals have different relationships to an institution, but then there are the larger historical, and political and economic structures that hold that make it so that we keep. We keep reproducing in inequalities within institutions, and so um, I think the only thing, only I, I'm not sure that you can get to um, institutions that serve everyone without looking at the the forces that are holding our disconsciousness about why they aren't serving everyone in place. I guess I had a question um, concerning kind of uh, political action or activism as something that uh, illuminates non-self. There's this notion that you sit in your cushion and you see the five skandhas as empty and they, there's no self there. But I've had the experience with like political solidarity movements where in a group where we're kind of coming together under one identity to advocate for say Michael Brown's body by doing a die-in in Central Square. The, it kind of opens a kind of insight into non-self that, and I, I was wondering if you could speak to kind of modes of activism or maybe modes of using art, uh, art practices in activism that can actually cultivate an insight into non-self that is not all in the meditation cushion and that there could be other forms where we can see our solidarity and our interpenetration with another, one another um, on the street, and if you've experienced that. Um, yes, you know, as you were saying that, what came to mind uh, to me is a situation right now, at this day, that's happening where uh, the Federal Government Bureau of Land Management is giving away to uh, silver mining, European silver mining company, uh, the Apache, some of the Apache sacred lands. And they're out there now protesting, trying to keep it from happening, but uh, it's just one, one of the, another one of those things, the insensitivity of the dominant culture to something that's very important uh, has happened over and over and it continues to happen over and over again. 
Um, it's more important for this this company out of Europe to mine that land than it is to preserve it for the Apache people who've been going there for centuries uh, for sacred ceremony. I don't think that even responded to what you asked. <laughs> <laughs> but I claim my age. <laughs> I guess a concise way of saying it is, uh, how, does, uh, how does the ability to feel solidarity with people that are unlike you, uh, like a, a real practice in, in gaining insight into non-self, the fact that I can feel some commonality with someone that I, I, on the surface, may feel very distinct from, but something just cuts through that. And it's not really an on-the-cushion thing. And how, how can we cultivate that as part of our Buddhist practice? I, I think to, to try to understand, to learn from, from people who are unlike us, what they feel about themselves in a non, in a, in to do it in a non-judgmental way. Uh, not that they're better or worse or anything else, but that they're different and try to understand the differences. Um, one of the things about native uh, people is that there's an incredible sense of humor that you don't pick up when you see the photographs of the old stern warrior. Uh, but that's a very powerful, um, in that culture, a very powerful way of preserving self and dignity. Uh, if you saw the movie Run With Wolves, uh, what most people don't know is that the woman who was the Lakota consultant for the language there taught all those actors to speak in the feminine dialect. So you have these wonderful actors speaking as women, you know, and that's a, a big thing uh, among the people. <laughs> but it's a powerful tool to appreciate. And, and there are other things you just learn about other cultures and learn to appreciate where they're coming from without being judgmental. But you're being laughed at by lady people a lot. <laughs> And in some ways, let's just say something. In some ways, you know, on the cushion, off the cushion, all the same. On the cushion just gives you some uh, uh, chance to see under lab conditions something that hopefully you can keep paying attention to off the cushion, because the same mind that's playing out, <laughs> whatever the position you're in, your legs are in, and if you're moving or not moving, right? Um, and this point of you know the the anatta, the seeing the not selfness, is more sort of a tool to pull apart the way that we see reality usually. Um, and I think one element as far as race goes is, um, particularly for white people, there's an arising of self that's unseen, you know, where people of color is more uh, noticed that because it's you know, defined as the other, but there's an arising of self that's not seen. Uh, and so I think what's helpful is to actually see that. And even when one has penetrated that uh, this uh, entity is fictitious, still the arising of self will continue, uh, likely, uh, but then can one see that? Can one see those arisings? And if we don't, then we act from that, we act through that, we enact that on others in a way that can be harmful. Uh, so uh, in some ways it's like not skipping over that, you know, but like uh, in some ways be becoming more attentive to that, getting interested in that, seeing that and how that interacts with others. I think I want to pick up, I think I'm coming some from where uh, Anushka is speaking. I think there's a confusion here about what no self is. Uh, and we've had that confusion a bit between emptiness and so-called um, reality or, or, or uh, uh, the relative, okay? In Buddhist history and many religious traditions, life is looked at as delusion and um, to get through that, uh, there's a one stream of practice of, of eliminating discrimination, okay? From, I think, uh, a lot of Buddhist practice has taken a positive, not only a deconstructive sense of our materialist self-creation, the, the self of a chair, the self of a person, as if it could exist apart. But as Anushka was saying, to see through that not only do we deconstruct our fixed constructions, but there's a positive aspect then that we can, in the co-creation, have multiple identities. We can take on 
the identity of a situation. It still has no fixed self. It still is in flux. If we cling to it as if it's fixed, it has suffering. But the liberation, for me, is that we can reclaim existence, reclaim life uh, in its fullness, in its momentariness, in its non-fixedness, in its co-creativeness. So when we talk about no self, I, I think the freedom of real no self is to be able to not only disidentify, but to take hold and identify. And the path is through things, not jumping over things, and that's been said a lot of times today, not to bypass, but to really be present to the particular and to, to untangle the elements, or as Anushka also said, the causes, you know, in a sense to go deeper into what the situation is, not only in the individual moment, but in the systemic. Uh, another point that I earlier wanted to bring up is quite different. Um, and it's a problem for me. Uh, it's been a real um, cause of re-examination of my own tradition. Two things. One, there was a translation group translating Dogen Zenji Shobogenzo of American scholars and Japanese scholars. Dogen, Ehei Dogen, is considered one of the two greatest Japanese Buddhists. But in his writings, he's very prejudiced against the Japanese untouchables. Very um, racist. And they came to these portions of his writings, and the Japanese wanted to blot it out, and the Americans wanted to bring it forward. Because I think of our history here, and our way of dealing with our history. <clears throat> and that, that brought up two major things for me. Dogen is a powerfully great practitioner <coughs> with one of the broadest visions of enlightenment in, in, in Buddhist writing. And yet he could have blind spots. There is no person and no institution that is not going to have blind spots. Um, so one of the questions for me today, and I guess one of the joys of what we're trying to do, we are trying to lift our blind spots here. But we can't count on just because Buddhism has the tools that it's going to happen. And I guess that brings me back to uh, Professor Halsey's initial um, reframing of our discussion. Uh, will it be the circumstances we bring to Buddhism that will create Buddhism's new manifestation here? Uh, in Buddh Buddhism is flexible enough to address problems, but it won't happen unless we bring the problems to it. So I guess my question for the panel is, you know, we're doing some of this today, but how can we really <coughs> make sure in our own practice, in our sanghas, and in the larger sense that we can bring problems uh, to this lens and other lenses that will be helpful, because it won't happen automatically. Thank you. Maybe if I can just add one uh, thought um, following up uh, the last comment. Uh, one of the things I, uh, the discussion about no self and so on indicates that Buddhism has a lot of very powerful tools that help us to overcome the constraints of human difference. But it also, when you look at the heritage, say within its ethical teachings, one of the prime images of the, the perfect uh, moral person is like a mother for her only child. Uh, in which we see that human difference is key to understanding perfection. Uh, this is that it's as a woman in a re particular relationship that we see this human perfection. Because they, we have something about it in terms of issues about poverty and class, that it extols quite often the human perfection that is achieved by people who are suffering in the world because of social and economic oppression for whatever reason, and perhaps only the accidents of history. Uh, you could say it doesn't offer us the resources that say, oh, human perfection is seen in the reality of the way of life of a woman of color. And so then you just say, oh, that is something that we can anticipate in the future. And it would be also something that uh, we, we might anticipate for us as Americans to say, it's not a question of transcending race. 
it's a question of being able to say, oh, American perfection looks like this, in which that we have to kind of see, we only see it here in terms of, oh, say, a woman of color, uh, and what she offers to us, uh, this is the model of human perfection. And so that's one of the things to just say. It's not only a question of transcending human difference, it's also seeing that human difference shows us realities of perfection that's hard for us to see in our own particularity. Could I just add that I, I think it's seeing the woman of color, and I also think it's seeing the wealthy white male. It's like, what, it's like we have to look at both of those, and we have to understand what both of them mean, for, because they're constructed as poles, they're, as a polarity. And um, it, you know, it's not to say that in any of those, we aren't all in it, but I think we're, again, just like the panel this morning was saying, we wanna, when we look at race, we want to look at people of color. We don't want to look at whiteness and what, what that has meant in this society. And the fact that there's nothing that determines the course of a, pers of, of a white person's life versus a person of color's life, so important is waking up white and going out into the world every day in quotes white. And so, um, you know, it, it's like, I feel like, and, and the same thing with poverty. We always look at poor people and the problems of poor people. And, you know, in, you, I should say impoverished people. I know Mel King always says, don't say poor people, say impoverished people. <laughs> but, you know, looking at impoverished people and knowing that something happened on the collective to make them in that situation. And so what, what is it about how wealth operates? I mean, that's what Anushka was saying too. It's like, what is it about how wealth operates? So we have to do, I think that what maintains that blind spot is not looking at the other side, you know, looking at the side of power. We always want to look at the side, side of, um, of, of, that's targeted. People question. You just leave Lenny. What strikes me is that, um, you know, we haven't talked much about the Brahma Viharas as a tool for, uh, for uh, addressing racism and the otherness of people. And, and as a way, sorry, about the Brahma, uh, the otherness of people. Oh, oh, the yeah. Brahma okay, Bihara, okay, so okay. Uh, mm -hmm. compassion, loving kindness, equanimity, and empathetic joy, uh, as really, I think, profound tools to bring into um, the cultivation of non-self in a way that allows us to remain deeply connected. Um, but so I'd be interested in hearing, I mean, any one of you who might uh, talk a bit about how that might be possible to do through maybe some of those lenses, if, if you even thought about using that particular framework. Yeah, definitely. I think it's a um, it's a very helpful um, framework, and in some ways, it's seeing the ways in which we set up boundaries in the heart between uh, who's inside, who's outside, and then being very honest about seeing like who is in those circles, who's in the ones I care about, who's in the people I don't pay attention to uh, orbit, and who's in the people who I fear or hate orbit. You know, and um, and working with the that as that arises as conditioned patterns of mind. Um, uh, it's a very, very powerful practice. And um, to speak also to the um, previous question, I think the way that, that things will uh, change, I think there's probably a lot of teachers and there's students here who will be teachers uh, in some way, is um, if people see these questions about attending to um, race as actually central to what they're interested in, you know, not like a random side project that someone is making you think about or, you know, that's beside the point or like, when I get time to, will attend to. Um, so I think the framing of, of the issue is central to both our own liberation, but also the um, freedom of society, and uh, not a side project, but actually um, very central to uh, the enterprise of a spiritual life, of a whole life of uh, humanity uh, is critical. Um, and uh, I'm just throwing in like every last thing that I want to say now. It's also uh, in relation to a... Uh, Christopher's question about, you know, I, I feel like also another interesting way of this um, happening is through art and film. And actually now more and more that um, 
you know, people with the smartphones have the ability to film things rather quickly. That both, I think, has um, brought a new life to racial justice movements as there's the ability to actually document uh, injustice that's happening uh, and then share that so people can see that on a variety of different levels. Uh, but then also the ability to share different perspectives. Uh, so there's access for different people to make films and to um, share perspectives in ways that there hasn't been in the past. So I feel like that's a, a hopeful thing about um, social change too. Can I just add one thing about the drama of the horrors of compassion, loving kindness, equanimity, sympathetic joy. In the Theravada tradition, at least, you have a very powerful idea that parents have all of those things naturally. It's a very interesting idea that certain kinds of things that some of us have to achieve by meditation, other people have just by being who they are. And so how that works in the world is like something for me that's just a very interesting thing to reflect upon. Okay, we're going to thank our panelists for their insights. Thank you.